Good morning, everybody, and welcome to a Mortgage Coach Tuesday interview. My name is Dave Savage. I am the CEO of Mortgage Coach, and it's always my honor to bring amazing guests and to put on a great Tuesday, uh, I guess, sales meeting. Uh, here at Mortgage Coach, we believe that loan, the best loan officers are the best teachers. That's why we created the total cost analysis to help loan officers turn that borrower education into a competitive advantage. Uh, we don't think the best way to educate a family around how to build wealth with real estate, how to make great mortgage decisions, is this static PDF document. We believe that it's delivering graphs, charts. It's making the financial decision graphical, and it's providing leveraging modern media like video to deliver that experience. So one of the reasons why we started our um, Instagram account a few weeks ago several weeks. I mean, in addition, one, I just wanted to do something fun with my uh, daughter who's a junior in high school, so it was a fun way to collaborate with her. But I wanted to really visualize what's happening with Mortgage Coach in the real world. So if you're on Instagram, make sure you start following our Instagram experience or experiment. Uh, even if you don't do it on mobile, you can go online. You can just click on it from your own website. You can't participate without a mobile device, but you can you can check it out online. Um, for all you Mortgage Coach members, I am looking for pictures of Mortgage Coach in the real world. So I mean, this is a coffee shop in Northern California with a borrower. This is a, a loan officer, Scott Cummings, meeting with the realtor in Albuquerque, New Mexico. This is a millennial mortgage coach, you know, meeting with a realtor in Walnut Creek, California. You know, forward me photos of Mortgage Coach in the real world and help us tell stories on Instagram with Mortgage Coach. So today is uh, the kickoff of our December calendar. We have former Navy SEAL Phil Black is our guest. Phil, welcome to the call. Thank you, Dave. It's good to have you. And uh, I also, for the second half of the call, or I really think this, the last third of the call, we have Craig Strength. Craig, are you on the call? I am. Good. So Craig is a top mortgage coach professional. He's also the CEO of a, of a fantastic mortgage company in Washington, D.C., and he's got some new, unique and some incredible best practices on how he delivers an online mortgage coach experience. So Craig's going to jump in in the second half, but we're going we're gonna to kick it off with Phil. Uh, Craig, uh, if you could, make sure you control the mute on your side while, while Phil is speaking and sharing, unless you want to ask a question or add something, uh, if you could have your phone on mute. Okay, buddy? Oh, Bill. Muting now. All right. Uh, so I want to remind everybody, we record this call, like every call. Uh, we have an incredible YouTube channel. The Mortgage Coach team is uploading valuable training. Uh, you know, we've got over 1,200 videos uploaded. We're getting, you know, just crazy amounts of views. I mean, every single month, seven to 9,000 views of our videos, and every one of those is just helping a loan officer be a better teacher, be a better educator. So make sure you subscribe to that, and by the end of the day today, this video um, will be added to that amazing collection of education for mortgage professionals. So today is all about Phil Black. Uh, uh, Phil, welcome to the call. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, Dave. Thank you. Good. Well, a lot of folks in the mortgage coach community know you. Uh, when I was preparing for this, I realized just how, how deep you got into our community. Uh, you know, when I was preparing for my interview for Simon Sinek um, a couple months back, uh, I sent out, you know, a request for, hey, what questions should I ask Simon? And Phil, I have to say, of all the feedback I got from probably about, it was less than a dozen, it was probably six to eight people who I really respected and I thought could help me do a great interview. The feedback you gave me was by far the best, so I want to thank you for that. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah, so even when I'm not interviewing you, you're making our education better to the, the thousands of loan officers we serve, and really grateful for that. Um, I, we have a, some of you may not realize that I have a playlist called All Time, which basically stands for what I think, or, you know, it's really my subjective opinion on our best all-time calls, and we, we have hundreds of them. And Phil, you have two all-time. So out of 12, you know, calls that I've done, two of the all-time best are you, brother. You probably didn't realize awesome. that, did you? <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, so we've, we've got about six of Phil's videos in our community. So if you like what you hear on this call and you want to go deeper, 
one of the, I mean, his one that's been watched the most is what a loan officer can learn from a Navy SEAL. That was the first call. Um, of course, my all-time favorite was the one that you just you did on leadership. I I re-listened to that call just as a reminder myself that you know leadership isn't about telling people what to do. It's about sacrifice. And you know, I highly urge any member on this call if you've not listened to that call on leadership. I mean, it's it's priceless. You know, it's called the price of leadership by Phil Black. Check it out. So, so Phil, um, I'm going to hand it off to you. Let you share your screen. I know you've got a message that you want to bring to you know some of the best loan officers in the country as we kick off December. Uh, if you could kind of remind people on your backstory a little bit, just for anybody that hasn't heard you before, and then you know, make us better. You know, share some share some thoughts. Sure. Yes. Uh, thank you. Let me let me know if you you can see my screen, and then I'll I'll kick it off. Recovery. We see it. All right. Well, the, 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 it's hard to give a quick backstory just because my background bounces around quite a bit. But I was a, a, a public school kid from New York. Played basketball. I'm, I'm a taller guy. I'm, I'm six foot seven, and uh, was lucky enough to get recruited to play basketball. I went, I went up going to Yale and played basketball there. Left there and worked on Wall Street for a few years for Goldman Sachs. Had a, a big change of heart. Decided to to leave the private sector and to to join the Navy, I was a Navy SEAL officer for six years. Left the Navy, went to Harvard Business School to try to segue out of the the running and gunning and get back into the real world. After uh, after business school, left and 9/11 uh, happened, and that threw me for a little bit of a loop. So I had a little bit of a of a stop stop back off at Goldman Sachs for about six months, and then decided that that was not really in keeping with with what I really want to do with my life, and I wound up leaving and becoming a firefighter down in San Diego, uh, where we moved from San Francisco. At the same time, I wanted to have a big family and realized that firefighters don't make that much money, so I decided to start a fitness company called FitDeck. Uh, built that up for about eight years and was, was lucky enough to get onto Shark Tank, pitched my business on Shark Tank, did not get a deal on Shark Tank, but was able to sell the business a few years after that. Um, that was last year, and I continue to be a firefighter now and um, do some speaking and also started a new college counseling, online college counseling business, which maybe we can circle back to at the end if we have time. Love it. Perfect setup uh, and looking forward to your message today. Great. Well, I thought it would be appropriate and fitting given that we just had Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone. To address this topic of recovery, given that hopefully everybody had a little time to recover over the holiday and, and that maybe over the coming weeks people will have more of a chance to recover. And I've been speaking and thinking and studying and talking a lot about this to not only friends and family, but some clients that I, uh, that I do some presentations for, the, the likes of Deloitte and Dolby and, and a lot of government agencies. And this is really for people who are go-getters, like all the people on the call I presume, and it's it's just interesting because, and, and I'll be the first to say that I would raise my hand for this, recovery and, and taking some time for yourself and relaxing, dare I say the word, has often had, had bad connotations. And uh, as I was coming up the ranks and really putting my head to the grindstone, I used to think that, that recovery and, and taking my foot off the, off the pedal was a sign of weakness, a sign of complacency something that I didn't do because I had to do X, Y, Z, I had to get to X, Y, Z, I had to get the sales quota X or Y. And having some time to reflect on it and think about it over the last probably two years or so, it's become a, a very valuable tool and something that I wanted to touch on during our talk and during our conversation today. And specifically how of all the different strategies, the recovery strategies that we'll talk about, I'm going to really zero in on sleep. It seems uh, it often seems like an obvious thing, and, and people I know have heard about, heard it before, and it comes in the news every once in a while about how, how important it is. I'm going to dig into it a little bit more and, and try to give some ideas on what some strategies are and why it's uh, why it's so important. But before we go too headlong into recovery and sleep, I wanted to take a little bit of a higher view, a 30,000 foot view, as to how recovery fits into what I might call a, a larger success formula. I hate to call it a formula. Uh, success is a, is a very relative word. Everybody has their own definition. 
but I just wanted to throw out what I perceive as the, the four pillars of success. And of, of course, success can mean, um, you know, it can mean financial, it can mean happiness, impact, significance that you have in your life, whatever the case may be, everybody looks at it a different way. And that would, that'll be a whole other webinar as to how we all, we all define success for ourselves. But I'm going to put up my four, the four pillars of when I go through my head and I try to think about what has been, what has helped me be successful in one way or another over the years. There's a couple things that come to mind. Number one is skills. These are the things that, the requisite things that we have to master to perform any task. Obviously in the SEAL teams we do things like shooting proficiency and diving and close quarter battle and communications and radio. These are all skills that we are constantly 24-7, 365, honing and tweaking and upgrading. Uh, these days, it's, for me, it's, it's more like making sure I'm up with technology, making sure my, my knowledge and my, uh, my expertise in, in other realms of, of, uh, of the business world, whether it's, uh, as Dave said, whether it's Instagram or, or YouTube or new online email platforms, whether it's the case may be, there are certain skills that have to be mastered, have to be upgraded, have to be looked at time and time again to make sure that you're that you're progressing and that you're keeping up the speed. The way that technology is these days, skills can degrade pretty quickly, um, and it's a, so it's an important thing. Whether it's keeping up on rules and regulations, keeping up on what's happening in, in the economy, uh, very important stuff. A lot of times we acquire these through school, through through modeling, through trial and error, through mortgage coach, through watching videos, through uh, just self uh, self education, but obviously very important things. Secondly, mindset. This is where probably of all things, every one of these four things is important. But mindset always seems to bubble up to the top. This is really where the the Navy SEALs make their money in terms of persevering and and not giving into into issues, problems, being resilient persevering, all super important things, pushing through tough times, understanding that tough times are going to be inevitable. And you know, I, li I like to tell my kids that that uh, bumps in the road or issues or problems are going to be inevitable, uh, and so can your sets be inevitable if you continue to push through them. Extremely important element, probably the biggest, the most important element in SEAL team training uh, of all the elements is this, this, this idea of mindset. And then connections, connections to other people, you know, and the big picture, I could argue that every one of these things is the most important, but, in, but with respect to connections, nothing else really matters unless we have other people in our lives to help, to share, to relate to, to connect with, whether it's a family member, whether it's colleagues, whether it's your network, an affinity group, whether it's a, a recreational team that you play on, a congregation that you're part of, alumni, whatever the case may be, these connections really are, are what make life beautiful. And, and so many stories out there, people at the end of their lives, people ask them, well, what, what really made the most, what was the most impact on you as you look back over your 80 or 90 years? And it's typically the people, the relationships, the friends. These are the things that, that really um, make a huge impact in our lives. And then lastly, energy. Energy is what feeds the machine, what feeds our bodies, what feeds our minds. How do we perform at a very high level? And this is what I want to specifically focus on today is um, if we don't have the energy to find the ways to acquire the skills, to push through the tough times, to engage and connect with others, then, then we're in big trouble. So it's one of those chicken and egg things. You need the energy to be able to build those skills, to be able to have that emotional uh, emotional ability, to have that good mindset, to have those connections and that, that that social connection with other people. So what I'm going to be focusing on most is how we generate energy. And energy, unfortunately, um, for high energy people, not unfortunately, but for high energy people, we share a lot of characteristics. Most of them are good, by the way. Most of them people would, would die for. Uh, but we're always on the go. We are, are multitaskers, especially with our devices now. We typically don't think we need a lot of sleep or we don't get a lot of sleep because we're so high energy. We have so many things we want to do or that we, we feel like we're obligated to do. We work through weekends and nights, particularly in your business, when everybody feels like they, they want to be able to talk to you at, at a moment's notice. And 
the blurring of the lines between work and play has become a major, major issue. We call it the, the human energy crisis. And it's, a, it's an epidemic around the world, partly enhanced by these mobile devices that allow us to keep up at all times at traffic lights and standing in the, in the restaurant or standing online at the grocery store. We're, just, we're always, if we don't put boundaries in there, we're always connected and blending work and play, which, which again, for high energy people, uh, eventually can become overwhelming. We're always available, as I touched on. And it just seems like we seem to be involved in everything, whether it's our kids, our school, volunteer programs, we're on boards, we're on PTA, involved with other parents. It's, and particularly in the mortgage world, it's connecting that work and play is, seems to be the nature of the business. And sometimes it's, it's in our personality. And oftentimes it's, it's just a habit that we, we have, have lived with and dealt with for our entire lives. Maybe it's part of our DNA. But what happens is if, if you keep at high energy for too long, that can often induce stress. And I know stress can often have a, uh, can often have a negative connotation. Oh, I'm so stressed. I, I wish I had less stress. Stress, stress, stress. Stress is too much. I'm too stressed out. You hear your kids. It's, it's becoming a very overused word in our lives. And, and for good reason. I, I just want to at least throw out there that stress can be good because stretch is what allows us to grow. We don't always want to be a flatliner. We want to, we want to have that stress. However, it has to be met with recovery. If you want to get the most out of your high energy and the most out of that stress, there needs to be a, a, a kicking back of, or a, a building in of energy as opposed to always energy going out, 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 out. And that's not to say that the, the stress that you feel has to be met in a one-to-one -one ratio of the recovery. For instance, if you say, I was just on a three-hour stressful conference call negotiating XYZ fee or negotiating XYZ issue, that doesn't mean that you need three hours off to go hang out at the spa and just do nothing. It, it doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one ratio, but we like to say that there's got to be some measure of recovery, and it can be small, and we'll, we'll talk about a couple different ways, sleep in particular, but there are all kinds of strategies as to how to put little bits of recovery, even a minute here, a breathing exercise there, to make sure that it's not chronic stress. It's not stress that's over and over, weeks and weeks at a time, sometimes years at a time. And what I've found over the last couple of years, especially talking to big corporations, is this is not just a, a um, touchy-feely, new age, or oh, wouldn't it be great if everybody took some time out of their lives to recover and meditate and everything's cool. It's not really that. There is a strong business case to be made here. It's not a just a suggestion to make everybody feel better. It makes business sense, and people like Deloitte Consulting, they're not going to be implementing a cultural shift to incorporate relaxation, meditation, and these recovery strategies into their business if there wasn't a bottom line intact attached to it. It sounds cold and crass, but they're not going to do it because it looks great on the recruiting part of their website. They have a lot of people who want to be there. They, they just have to get more out of their people, and they can't burn people out. So there's, def there's definitely something here that, uh, that people are paying attention to, whether it's having the employees or, or yourself more satisfied, more engaged, more fulfilled, whatever, whatever the case may be. And this, this graph, I think, really shows what, what I mean. You know, we all typically, I know myself included, I, I've been for 20 years, I've been Played most of my played most of my cards in the red zone here, where it's stress, stress, stress. I'm giving a lot of energy, whether it's to my business or to uh, to business school, or whether it's to a private entity or my kids or whatever the, whatever the case may be. It's a lot of stress and the energy out. And again, that's that's in my opinion added to a lot of growth. I've had a great life. I've done a lot of different things, as most of you had have. The most the more times we're stressed, the more growth we have. However, I've really started to incorporate more of the green zone, more of the recovery, more of bringing energy in to allow that growth to really flourish and not to, to potentially open myself up for, for overuse injuries as it relates to fitness, to chronic stress, diabetes. Um, there's all kinds of, of physical uh, issues that happen when you have this chronic stress uh, in your life, high blood pressure, um, heart disease. These are major, major things, 
particularly for people in their 40s and 50s who, who have high energy slash high stress, high performance jobs. Um, I'll just throw out there that, that I'd like people or suggest people to play around a little bit, see if you can work in that, in that green zone. I, I've talked to CEOs who, who in front of their the entire executive team have raised their hand and said, I don't know how to, how to operate in that green zone. I, I don't know how to do it. I need help. I can't relax. I can't read a pleasure book. I can't watch a comedy. I can't, you know, I'm always on the go. And I think that we work on quite a bit with, um, with some of those executives. So there are some recovery strategies. You've probably seen them over time. There's, there's exercise, of course, the, the great elixir. We won't, we won't discuss that at length, but obviously most people know that if you're a, if you're a regular exerciser, that's definitely going to be a big stress reliever. I know people I talk to all the time, is they have to get their run in, they have to get their, their, their little yoga in, their exercise, their Pilates, whatever it is. So that's a huge recovery strategy that, that will solve a lot of these problems. Meditation. Meditation, we, again, we won't go into detail. I, I have a meditative practice that I do every morning. It, it's not, uh, it's not transcendental. It's not anything in particular. It's just my own little, little routine that I have in the morning. I go on a walk in the morning, usually about 15 minutes. And I do some breathing exercises, which um, we could talk about morning routines, maybe in a different session. But the Navy SEALs now are doing a lot of meditation, the, uh, what we call op tempo or operational tempo that the Navy SEALs are, uh, are, are out on these days, which is how many operations do you do in a, in a particular month. It's, it's so fast and furious that, uh, that they're, I don't want to say mandating, but they're, they're really pushing these breathing techniques, meditation techniques to try to, to, try to relieve some of that mental and, and physical stress that, that some of these special operators are under. Recreation, getting out and, and socializing with friends, playing board games, going to a movie, playing, uh, playing in a softball league. There's all kinds of recreational things that, that we like to consider recovery strategies. Socializing, again, going out with friends, uh, getting together on weekends, going to barbecues, going to tailgates, going on a picnic, something like that. Socializing, socializing is a great way. To recover, a lot of people recover by chatting with other people, listening to other people's issues, and, and, and commiserating with them. And then lastly, and the one we're really going to focus on is sleep. Sleep is a recovery strategy. It's the one we're going to dig into in, in a little bit of detail here, and it's, it's, um, it's basically forced recovery. It's, it's involuntary non-movement, and a lot, of happen, a lot of great stuff happens when you sleep. Mandatory downtime, our, our brain recovers as we sleep. Most, some people have heard of the, the term REM sleep. That's when our brain recovers. That's when all those things that have been rattling in your head, whether it's a to-do list or something you have to think about the next morning, a presentation you have to give, a deal you have to close, a, a loan you have to write, one of those umpteen details that you have to, you have to close the loop on to make sure that you get your, your loan closed. When you're sleeping, your brain is recovering and, and I don't know if anybody ever remembers back in the day when your computer with the little pop-up window would come up and it would it would ask you if you wanted to defrag your hard drive, and I always just said yes because it sounded like a good thing. And what what that was doing back in the day is taking your hard drive and and recompartmentalizing all those folders and files that you had up during the day and shoving them all to one side of that hard drive so we could open up more space in the rest of the hard drive. Well, technology has come a long way. It it does that automatically now, but but the the, uh, the metaphor is the same. When you sleep, your brain takes all those things that you're worried about and thinking about, and it, and it, and it puts them aside, and it lets you work some of those issues out, oftentimes through dreaming. Uh, your body also recovers when you're sleeping, as, as most people know. That, that happens in non-REM sleep. When you get into your real deep, deep sleep, that's when your muscles, the cells in your muscles recombine. That's when your, your, uh, the, the stuff that you're do, doing during the day, the food that you eat, the, 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 the cellular regeneration and cellular growth, and that's how, that happens in real deep sleep. So that's obviously a part of recovery, physical recovery, as opposed to the, the brain recovering. Ideally, we're sleeping seven to eight hours a night. I know if, if, if we could see everybody raise their hand, how many people sleep seven to eight hours? It's probably not that many. I think the national average in the United States is six hours a night of sleep. Back before we had electricity, we used to get 10 hours of sleep. So we've almost cut that by half through the advent of, of electricity and other things that are that are taking our time during the day, but um, that's, that's uh, in, in a very uh, 
interesting statistic, I think, that we're almost sleeping half as much as we did before. And it, it, we, we sleep so for a third of our it, lives. And we, if we sleep for that long during a day, that, that's a lot of time that we're sleeping, and we may as well make the best of it. Most people don't think that much about the quality of their sleep or, or worse, as I've been, as I've been uh, guilty of, consider sleep sometimes an inconvenience. Sometimes I think of eating as an inconvenience, but uh, we do so much of it, eating and sleeping, that we may as well maximize it as much as possible, and that's what we're going to talk about today. I've come to grips with how important sleep is and consider it a, a critical part. Maybe it's because I've gotten a little bit older and things don't seem to heal as much and, and, uh, and my brain doesn't seem to be uh, quite as, as robust as it used to be, so maybe that's why I'm, I'm uh, it's not an afterthought for me anymore. It, it's front and center in, in, uh, in, in the wellness trajectory that I'm on. I used to be on, on high performance and go, 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 and I'm going to do CrossFit and I'm going to beat my personal record and all these things. and I'm, I'm much more, my trajectory now is much more of wellness as opposed to elite performance or, or getting a personal record on this particular event. And sleep plays a, a huge role in that. So I'm going to go over a couple of sleep strategies. Some of these hopefully you'll recognize. I'm going to add a little color to these and, um, and hopefully we'll get to the end and, and something will resonate with you and maybe you'll, you'll, uh, you'll get something you could actually implement. Consistent bedtimes is at least the science says, the number one factor in getting a good night's sleep. And by consistent bedtimes, that means, in, in my particular case, I'll, I'll make it personal here, I go to bed at 10.30 every night and get up at 5.30 every morning. That's seven hours of sleep. And the reason that it happens is your body becomes very accustomed to doing that, much like Pavlov's dogs, uh, the Pavlov's dog experiment. If you train your body to go to sleep at the same time every day, your body will start to rev itself up and cool itself down by the time 10.30 starts coming around. And I know my wife can attest when it gets to be about 10.15, my eyelids start to shudder and she doesn't even have to look at her watch. She'll know that it's exactly 10.15. And by the time it's 10.30, I have a little routine that I go through and I will get to sleep so quickly that it makes my sleep more, uh, more satisfying and, and, and more productive because I immediately, I'm not hemming and hawing and rolling over and wondering about this and that. I, I quickly go to sleep at 10.30 and wake up at 5.30, and it's because your body learns to trust what you're doing. If you go to bed 9 o'clock one night, and then you stay up and watch a movie till 11.45, and then the next, next night you go to bed at 10, and then you stay up and watch Colbert, and you go to bed at 12.15, your body is always in balance. It doesn't really know, is, is, he gonna go, is she going to go to bed early? Is he going to go to bed late? I don't really know. I'm just going to stay alert because I'm not really, I'm not really sure what's going to happen. So that's that's a piece of piece of advice. As much as possible, try to get try to get into a routine when it comes to that. Rituals. Rituals are what I like to call well-intentioned habits. Habits are, as we've talked about, things that you do routinely all the time. But a habit can be good or a habit can be bad. I, I like to call a ritual something that uh, is a habit that's moving in the direction of goodness, as opposed to obviously there can be bad habits as well. So there's some rituals that you can come up with before you go to bed, and, and some of those things we'll talk about next. Pre-sleep journaling. A lot of people find that they can't go to sleep because they're tossing and turning and they keep thinking about what they have to do the next day. They have to send this piece of information. They have to uh, redo this thank statement or whatever the case may be. So if you keep a little pad next to your bed, you can always jot down a few notes so that you get them out of your head and onto the paper. Oftentimes that, that leads you to sleep better. A dark room is, is also suggested. Not having a lot of blue lights and screens and technology bleeping and buzzing and and, or the, and the TV being on, or, or any, any of that technology and blue light should, uh, should be turned off. A warm shower or bath before bed can be a, a ritual or routine that, that gets your body and your mind into the routine and, and settles you into, um, gets your, your blood pressure down a little bit and just has a calming and soothing effect. Electronic shutdown, these are, these are things where you, you promise yourself that two hours before going to bed, you're not going to look at your iPhone, you're not going to refer to the iPhone, Pad. You're not going to check your emails. I know it's a, it's a tough thing to do, and it, it may feel awkward for a few weeks. But it's one of those things that if you can if you can do it, it uh, it just keeps some of those those gremlins out of your head right before it's time to go to sleep. Exercise. We all know exercise can uh, can wear you out physically, and that will get you more tired at the end of the day. Uh, we usually suggest exercising in the morning because that has a, a great burning, calorie burning effect and energy uh, effect throughout the whole day. But by the end of the day, if you've had a great workout, 
most people would attest that that's going to that's going to help them go to sleep faster. Some people use candles. Again, it has a calming effect. It has a soothing effect. It's it's not bright fluorescent lights, but if you can get into the routine of seeing and and um, and getting into that that mindset of um, um, I, le I light some candles up as I'm brushing my teeth, as I'm as I'm getting ready to bed, it, it often has some some great impact. Some people like to read before they go to sleep. That calms their mind. That, that's a great strategy also. Soothing music. There's all kinds of of, uh, of ability to use Pandora or use other soothing music uh, playlists to, to help you calm down. Again, this is just a menu of things. Not everybody has to do all these. I don't do all these. It's just things to, to pick from. Quality sheets it may, uh, may raise an eyebrow, but again, if, as long as you're going to be going to sleep and if you buy into this idea that sleep is so important and critical and why should it be an afterthought, Maybe getting a really high quality sheet to spend enough time in your bed, getting a high quality sheet that really feels great on your body and, and it's just you feel like it's a treat to go to bed, not just a uh, you're not just spending your time or doing your time in bed, but you're actually having a, a great time there. Quality pillow, again, it's anything to make the, the, the sleeping experience something that is, is maximizing. There's, there's a couple good pillows out there. My pillow is a, is a great one for a high quality pillow. Again, I you know, for years, whatever the pillow was, was, was just an afterthought. And um, with, I have quality sheets now and a quality pillow, and, and even maybe it's just psychological, but it, it can make a difference. TV usually not a great thing to do at night. There's all kinds of sights and sounds that, that can really uh, throw you off or, or get into your head, so maybe, maybe shut the TV off an hour before going to bed. Phone being near or by your bed. I know a lot of people use their phone as their alarm clock, but it's just very tempting to sit in bed with uh, and, and put that iPhone out in front of you and start looking through through texts and through emails while you're in bed. You know, maybe, maybe experiment a little bit and try to keep that away from your bed. Making your bed, interestingly, it's uh, they found in studies that, that kids who make their bed every morning are, are significantly more successful than people who don't. And I think part of it is that they're getting an early win in the day as as, as as lame as that might sound, doing it, making your bed in the morning, even if the rest of your day is completely out of control and things fell apart, you didn't get anything done, and the deal, this deal fell through, and so and so didn't get you the lead that you wanted. There's some little element of coming back to your room at night and having the bed made, meaning, oh yeah, that's right. I, I had the first victory of the morning with mine. I made my bed, and now I'm seeing it's nice and made when I get back to it. Uh, the day wasn't all that bad, so I get up earlier than my wife. So it's, it's not really on me to make the bed, it's on her to make the bed, so that, that may be the, the case with some of you, but it's, uh, it's a very interesting psychological uh, and behavioral uh, thing that happens um, just by making your bed. A lot of military people make their bed throughout their whole lives. And then lastly, ambient noise. Some people use different types of noise machines. Uh, an interesting study came out and they did a, a, a very big study on what type of noise was the most conducive to sleeping. And interestingly, at least I thought it was interesting, the two noises were, number one, a crackling fire, and number two, a breathing dog. And if you think back over time, back in the, uh, back in the olden days, when we used to sleep out, out in, the, in the wild and we'd have a crackling fire because we needed it to eat, we needed it for warmth, and by the time we fell asleep, it would probably be a light crackling fire. And then we would typically have a dog or an animal near us sleeping with us for uh, for comfort and for security and for safety, so they found that having those two noises in the background were uh, were most conducive for uh, for sleeping. And you can find those, by the way, you can find ambient noise with those two with those two effects on uh, on iTunes. So in wrapping up, you know the, the the process here is we we are all in, have had success in our lives, and success typically comes from being a high energy person, and it requires to be high energy most of the time. Uh, but high energy can often lead to stress, and my pitch here is that stress, uh, without a measure of recovery, can lead to chronic stress and um, and medical issues, and just not getting more out of your life, not sustaining that that success over time. And one of the recoveries, the one that I really harped on today, is sleep. And hopefully, I've made a a good pitch and given you a couple of suggestions or or a, a menu of things that you could choose from to get sleep take sleep seriously, and ultimately sustain that success. Because it's, it's not that hard to be a success if you have a work ethic, because you just put your head down and you just crank, 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 and 
and you can have some great success, but to sustain that success at decade after decade after decade after decade without burning out, without uh, having health problems, without having uh, mental issues, without cratering your family life, that sustained su success in multiple realms of life, uh, in my opinion, is, is probably the toughest thing to do. Everybody can do a run of three years, five years, two years, even a decade, but to sustain that success in family, business, community, church, faith, whatever it is, um, I'm becoming a big advocate for, for recovery and sleep as, as, one of the big, as one of the big things there. Dave, I, I, uh, I did not give you a chance to get a word in edgewise, um, and, uh, and uh, I apologize for that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave here with, uh, with my final slide, which is sleep is a terrible thing to waste, and realize that I haven't taken a breath, uh, nor to allow you to, <laughs> to weigh in. Uh, and I'm, I'm mindful of the time. I think we're, we're about where we want it to be, um, but I wanted to cer certainly open it up to you and, and see if any of, this, uh, any of this resonated with you or you think there are any questions that people might have. Yeah, so first of all, I mean, I think it's awesome to have a former Navy SEAL and a guy who's as accomplished as you are put this type of focus around recovery. Uh, I mean, everybody on this call is either, you know, a high-performing, elite, top-producing mortgage professional, and when you described all the things that we go through, um, we all have that in common, um, or, or we want to be, and we're struggling and thriving to get there. So there's no doubt, I mean, as I was listening to it, you know, when you said, hey, the guy who doesn't know how to turn off and is just go, 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 I mean, that's me. Um, I mean, there are some things that I can do to recover, but, you know, i got some great reminders, man. So a fantastic uh, body of work, as always. Um, you know, again, for you folks that, that want to, you know, hear things like what, uh, what loan officers can learn from a Navy SEAL, there's a whole body of work in the mortgage coach community from Phil Black. Uh, Todd Duncan was so impressed when I had Phil on a, on a call that he invited Phil to be one of the speakers. And Phil was, if not the highest rating speaker, not last year, but the year before, you were among the two. So um, you've got some incredible leadership, incredible knowledge, and I urge folks, um, hope you took some notes, got some value, but also check out some of Phil's other, other videos and other training material that's created from Morgan So Phil, real quick, I do want to get into our other guest, and Craig, hopefully you're ready to rock. Um, if you could tell us, um, you don't need to tell us about it because you framed it at the beginning, but uh, what's the website if people want to learn about your new startup? Where do they go? Yeah, the website, this is for, uh, for online college counseling for kids who are entering high school and try to make good decisions about um, what classes to take, how to get through high school, and what ultimately what colleges to get through, whether they're student athletes or considering ROTC or the service academy. Um, they can get weekly tasks and deadlines and projects. And the website is prepwell academy.com and uh, it will be coming up, it will be coming online soon and if, if you have a child who's entering high school or a couple years into high school it might be something that you want to um, to take a look at good well we have put Marcy put a link to that in our chat uh, the go to meeting chat if you have questions feel free to throw them in um, Phil please feel free to stay on at some color as we bring in our next guest uh, to tee up our next guest I want to I want to want to frame it this way as mortgage professionals, sometimes we're speaking to many. You know, we're on a stage, you know, like the Dave Ramsey, Churchill Group. We've got a booth. You know, we're influencing and educating people one to many. Sometimes as mortgage coaches, we've sent a link, and the family is looking at that. This is the first-time home buyer looking at a mortgage coach TCA, you know, from a coffee shop, and the loan officer is not talking to them. They're just going through it themselves. Sometimes it's a mortgage professional sitting with a borrower or a realtor, and they're walking them through, you know, financial strategies in person. You know, this is, this is a loan officer um, in Washington, D.C., who I've interviewed, you know, sitting with a realtor explaining how she creates urgency for rent versus own, you know, for, for buyers. This is a loan officer in Lexington, Kentucky, who brings a client into his office and creates this amazing experience. By the way, this is Marty Preston with Benchmark, and I, I did just recently make this one of our all-time, so out of 12, this call with Marty, I thought he crushed it in terms of, you know, 90% of his family is coming to his office. 
he creates this coliseum of awesomeness that's perfect for his market, perfect for his personality, and 90% of these families convert into a, a client for life. You know, this is this is Jay Crow in Seattle, um, the Seattle, Washington market. Again, 50% of his clients come into his office. And what I want to do is I'm building a body of training and work of loan officers that are doing the next best thing to a live in-office meeting. They're bringing families online with the telephone. Uh, Craig Spence, who's Churchill's, one of their top three loan officers, I interviewed him uh, about a week ago, and I put that online. Uh, last week, I interviewed Aaron Coker as part of my call where he shared, I sent an email to a borrower, they click on that email, and he drives this online experience. So I'm trying to build this body of work of, of training to help you as mortgage coach deliver the next best thing to an office meeting. And today uh, I'm bringing in really not just a great client, but a friend, Craig's friend. Um, Craig, welcome to the call, and I'm looking forward to having you share your process to everybody. Thank you, Dave. Good. So, hey, Craig, for people um, who don't know you, haven't seen you speak at, you know, you've, you've spoken to a lot of the industry's largest events, but just tell everybody what market you're in, uh, the type of production levels you do, and then let's walk them through your live experience process. Sure. Uh, my name is Craig Strand. I'm in the greater Washington market. I'm a uh, owner of a company since 1998 and also uh, an originator at the company. Uh, my loan volume this year is about uh, $85 million. Um, my business is primarily driven from financial advisor referrals and database management, uh, along with some general networking uh, and um, a good base of divorce lawyers uh, as well. So very much non-realtor, about 10% of my business is, is realtor. Uh, the rest is kind of all other non-traditional sources. Beautiful. And what percentage of your clients are you um, doing, uh, you know, call it your online experience? Yeah, I use the the Edge Live for pretty. I would say ninety five percent of my clients. I do it on almost every single client. Um, I, I rarely meet with a customer in person unless they want to. Traffic in Greater Washington, as many of you know, uh, is not so good, and it's just not that easy to get around. And it's not convenient people to come to our office. I also. I know you said this is the next best thing to meeting in person. Sometimes I think it's better uh, for both people because it, it forces both parties to be succinct and, and focus on the, on the delivery of the information and, and have it available to them. Uh, so you, you do give up a little bit on the face-to-face, on the -face, and I think there's a lot of value in that, and I did that for many years. But um, for the people on the call that are trying to do also some, manage some larger volume numbers, I think it's important to have a tool where you can, you can move quickly and, and still deliver a great experience. So how many of these live experiences do you do a month, just to get a feeling for the volume, or a day, or a week, however, however you think you want to measure it and share it with everybody? I, I do a few of them a day, so I guess, you know, 50 plus a month, and uh, I have uh, a team that helps me out, so sometimes other people on my team might be working with someone, and they might be using my, my Edge to do it as well. Um, I, I do it in multiple formats. Sometimes I do it Edge Live. Sometimes uh, I record, and I send uh, the Edge uh, separately, and it's not live, so I do it in a number of formats depending on who the referral source is, uh, who the client is, what kind of time they have available, and when we can connect. All right, so let's... Let's walk everybody through the process. And everybody, this is a time for you to be looking at your screen. Put down your mobile device. Uh, there's times where I want you to pick it up and make that part of the experience. But really, just learn. Focus for the next 15 minutes of this call. I want you to see what Craig does, how he delivers education to families. He's on the phone, pulls them in front of the computer. Craig, first, set the stage. You know, How do you get the family in front? I did um, put a copy of an email that you send out to families on the screen, but just give us a minute, set the stage, how do you get the family into this, and then I am going to pull up a live screen so that you could drive Edge Live with the link that you forwarded me, but set the table and then we'll start carrying Edge Live and get a feel for how you drive this education, this experience. Yeah, so um, I have a sort of a doctor nurse set up, so essentially the way the uh the inbound call comes in. It goes to uh, my mortgage planner, who I also call my loan partner, John. He, he generally takes the initial lead. He goes through uh, some scripting. If people are calling for rate and, and asking those kind of questions, we want to give them a rate answer, of course, right away without 
getting directly to that. So we might say something along the lines of, you know, I really appreciate you calling. Uh, what I'd like to do with your permission is take a few pieces of information uh, so that we can um, build out an online spreadsheet of options for you. And that uh, spreadsheet is going to show you rate, closing costs broken down to the dollar, loan structure, and your full payment. And I'd like to build that up for you, schedule a time for you to talk to Craig, and about 15 minutes before the call, I'll send that to you. Uh, we can do that later this afternoon at this time or that time. And Craig will jump on the call and walk you through everything. Is that OK? And almost all the time, 90% of the time, the customer will say, absolutely. And that kind of disarms things very quickly, and they provide us whatever information we need to do our job. Then. About 15 minutes before the call, and not too much before that, because I don't want them jumping in there and, and seeing things they don't understand or not really know what they're looking at. But 15 minutes before the call, John will send this email that you're looking at right now on your screen that says, you know, for your call with Craig, here's the things that, uh, uh, here's the link. So click here on that hot link as you can see there, and here's the different options he'll be reviewing with you. And then he provides at the bottom there, we have some language to, to help them in case they can't open the, uh, the link for any reason. He also tells them that they're going to get the link 15 minutes out of the call, and they should have it up and open on their screen when I call. This, I've learned over time, just saves me a lot of steps, and it saves them time for us waiting for them to pull it up. Oh, I'm not sure if I got it, and so on. So they get this link. They have it up. I jump on the phone with them. And uh, oftentimes, depending on who I'm talking to and what it's about, I oftentimes ask them if they'd like me to record the call. I have a recorder on my phone, and I say, uh, you know, I would say to you, Dave, hey, Dave, with your permission, what I'd like to do, since we're about to cover a lot of information, is I'd like to go ahead and record the call, I get permission to record the call, and then I forward it along uh, to, the, to the borrower afterwards. This has the benefit of, of them hearing everything I said, and also if there's another decision maker that's not on the call, then your borrower doesn't have to try to regurgitate all the mortgage information, and you know they're not going to do it at the same level that you're going to do it. So this gives that other person the ability to completely listen into the call. And I have found this to be really effective, very much the same way as when I record the video uh, for the Edge and send it along, and they could both watch it time and again. So um, that's definitely a best practice for me. Um, I also find, for those of you on the call who sometimes say, you know, sometimes you walk somebody through something, and then they say, oh, that's great. Can you send me an email? Uh, I find that literally infuriating. So um, having that recording allows them to listen to it. Obviously, having the Edge Live link allows them to, to go back to it again and again. So really a huge benefit of those two things. Um, so uh, my best practice, somebody else takes the inbound, sets me up for the callback. We email the link ahead of time with a breakdown of what it looks like. We tell them to have it up when I call. I jump on the call. I ask them if they'd like it recorded. And then I start to go through the Edge Live, which is where we are now, Dave. Beautiful. So I do want to remind everybody, and we will put a link. Uh, we have, I did record a call with Craig uh, Spence. Again, this is another loan officer that's doing this multiple times a day. And I literally recorded this training, call it the, an educational borrow experience from Craig. And, and I'm going to be interviewing more loan officers, um, mortgage coach loan officers that are delivering this experience so that you have a body of best practices how to get the family in front of it in a way to be educational. In Craig's case, he literally sends the email once the family is in front of it because he doesn't want them clicking on it and going around it. Um, right now, we're building these best practices. So, so Craig, uh, you know, let's play it as though the family you know, got your email, they clicked on your link, and then I actually have Mortgage Coach live here. Just, you know, you don't have to give us the full you know, by the way, how long are the conversations usually? What's the just, the time frame? You know, short to long. It just it just depends on it just depends on my read of the person. Are they are they a first time buyer with a million questions? Are they a move up buyer who knows what they're doing? I look at what their profession is. I could tell you know, are they an engineer? Are they a fast moving salesperson? It really just depends on the person. Is it one or two people on the phone? How fast do they want me to go? So the call can be anywhere from ten minutes to thirty minutes. Okay, got it. So ten to thirty and forty five would be a really long time. Um, it it would right. be, yeah. Okay, so let's do, you know, give us the highlights. You know, the client clicked on it, they get this. Do you tell them to, you know, tell, walk me through, pretend I'm a buyer. Sure. So what you're looking at here, Dave, is your, is your uh, monthly home ownership analysis summary. And I'm going to start by giving you kind of an overview, well, and we're really going to focus. Craig, Craig, I'm seeing the disclosure. So you just assume that they know to click on that, or do you tell them to click on that? I don't tell them to click on it. They've already clicked on it. Okay, so so they click on it. Okay, I am now looking right. at the summary. It's a rent versus own, and uh, go ahead. So 
So I'm showing you here a monthly home ownership analysis summary. What we're going to do today is we're going to look at a number of things. Uh, my purpose of the call is that when we're done, you're going to have a very good understanding of what the uh, different uh, loan structures that are available to you, what the total monthly payment is, what that in payment encompasses, what you'll need in terms of funds up front, and what you'll need on an ongoing basis. So I'm going to cover your total cost to close. I'm going to cover your total monthly payments and your different loan structures. After that, we're going to pause for a minute, see if you have any questions, because that's really the, the, the meat and guts of what we're going to cover. And then we're going to go a little bit deeper, and I'm going to show you how some of the benefits of renting versus um, owning versus renting come into play, and what the longer term cost is um, of the uh, purchase versus the rent. So I'll break those down for you a little more in detail. I tell people that I'm from New York, and I tend to talk a little quickly, so they could feel free to stop me any time if they have questions. And I check in with them throughout the course of the call to make sure that they're following along. So what you're looking at here, uh, and we're looking at the upper left quadrant here, and um, I'll ask at this point, can you see the column that I'm highlighting? So typically they can. And we're going to start by showing you a rent of $24.50. That's what you're currently paying now. And based on our conversation or the conversation you had with John earlier, um, we asked you a couple questions, one of which was, what's the maximum monthly payment you're comfortable paying? And you've given us some answers on that, as well as what the amount of cash to close that you ideally wanted to use. And based on those answers, we've built you out this uh, summary of options. We've got a few things we'll go to. Um, I know that you primarily wanted to look at 30-year fixed rate loans. So with that in mind and, and wanting to deliver what you asked for, I've got a 500000 a 550 and a 600,000 30-year fixed rate loan with 20% down as we discussed. I'm going to walk you through all those. At the end, I'm going to show you another alternative option just to give you a sense of how that compares, and that's the 7-1 arm in this far column. So unhighlighting these, I want to direct you here to the... We're not seeing the highlights, so are you highlighting on your side right now on the report? I am. Yes. Because I clicked on and who knows, maybe I clicked on the wrong one. You sent me an email. Yep. Uh, um, let's see. Uh, it says Dave Savage at the top, and it's a rep versus. I did. Own. Yep, mm -hmm. and I. It, it's on Edge Live. Okay. Let's see. I am going to one more time go in to the the link that you gave me. Okay. Just I just re case. just resent you another one. Oh, you did. Okay. Is are the numbers one B O B B O M? Uh, yeah, that was the first one. Okay. That should, so, that should still work. Uh, let's see. I'll click on that. Because I, again, as much as possible, want to make sure everybody gets to see the experience the way you're delivering it. All right. And I, and I do not see a, a live yet, but I, I do believe I've clicked on your link. Oh, you know what? Let me move this one over because it, yeah, it was me. All right. Okay. Now, the, by the way, it was highlighted. It's not highlighted, but if you could go ahead and, um, you know, we go. And it looks like it was something that I did. Okay. Go ahead. So at this point, I'll direct them to the total uh, payment column. And uh, I'm highlighting, and it doesn't look like it's on your side, but again, I'm, I'm highlighting the total payment right now. Um, <clears throat> and I'll show them the row of total payment. And then I'll click on the More Info button, and I'll change the screen. And, uh, <clears throat> and I'll let them know that I'm clicking on the More Info button. And then I'll go to the Payment Breakdown, and I'll show them that this payment breakdown includes principal and interest, property taxes, uh, and homeowner's insurance for a total monthly payment. And you'll see here the range on a $500,000 house up to a $600,000 house of about twenty-four dollars and change to almost $2,900. And that's an all-inclusive payment with taxes and insurance. I'll click on the next tab here to show you the closing costs, which I'm going to get into in further detail in a moment. But what I want to show you is there are two, there's um, different categories of costs, APR and non-APR costs, and we'll get into that in more detail, as well as your upfront payments for property taxes and homeowners insurance. And I want to let you know that this link stays active, and you can click on this fee detail button at any time for a breakdown to the penny of any closing costs you have. And we can get into that in more detail later. And I'm not going to do that with you guys now, Dave, but I, I give them the option to do that. So I'm going to X out of that. And that Hi, it is. Everybody. What you're seeing on my screen, Craig is driving that. Everything that is moving, Craig is moving. If you do not know how to use Edge Live, be sure to come to our Thursday call at um, 9 o'clock Pacific and learn how to use Mortgage Coach Live. But 
continue, Craig. I just want to make sure everybody's sure. the dots on that. So now, Dave, you could see the range of payments on the five hundred to six hundred thousand dollar home uh, that you were talking about. This is within the range of your maximum comfort level on monthly payments, and it's an all-inclusive payment. This is based on twenty percent down and a four hundred thousand dollar loan, and that's today at a rate of four percent, which is with no points or no penalty for prepayment. So at this point, you've seen the down, you've seen the uh, loan amount and the monthly payment. Uh, the next thing I'd like to show you is the total cash to close. And that's another major element of this. So if we unhighlight the payments for a second here, I want to show you on the bottom here that you'll see the total cash to close highlighted in this row here. And you'll see that on a $500,000 home, it's about 116, across to a $600,000 home at about 138. Now, your down payment is obviously uh, just a piece of that, but there's more to it. So I'm going to take us back to the closing cost tab and again show you that the down payment of 20% represents 110000 You've got your um, closing costs here. Remember that settlement charges encompasses two categories, closing costs, which are your hard third-party fees, and then your prepaids, which are your uh, establishment of your escrow account for future liabilities you incur on the property, as well as interest through the end of the month you close. When we add that all together, we come to 127198 So this will encompass everything you need to pay in terms of purchasing this house, with the exception of if you choose to do an inspection of the home or test for radon. And again, if you click this fee detail button, it gives you a full uh, breakdown to the penny. And I can tell you that these costs uh, don't vary very much from lender to lender. There's a few things in here that'll change based on the lender you choose. And at this point, I would kind of go through what those things are with the uh, borrower. So I'm going to X that out. I'm going to unhighlight. And now we're going to go back to the main summary screen. So at this point, and we'll pick the 550 home right in the middle here. At this point, we've covered what the monthly payment will be and how much cash you need to close. Are there any questions that you have at this time? No, this has been fantastic. <laughs> By the way, what do they usually say? I mean, how often do they comment on how cool it is? Because it's just, I mean, it's a great experience. You know, what's the yeah. feedback you get from the client? Usually if I go through payment and breakdown of cost and everything and rate, and then I check in with them and I say, you know, are there any questions you have at this time? Are you still with me? Um, anything like that, you know. Uh, they generally say no. Craig, uh, we, we've got it. This is the information we were looking for. Um, <clears throat> and, they're, and they're pretty comfortable at that point. There might be a small question, but there's usually nothing major at this point. Sometimes they want me to go back to the fee detail and go through it line by line. And I generally don't do that on the call because the link is active and they can go get it whenever they want. And that, that's very time consuming, obviously. So I generally don't do that on the call. Uh, oftentimes, John and my team will do that after the fact uh, if, they wanna, if they want a detailed breakdown and go through each one line by line. Understood. Okay, cool. So uh, at this point, what I would do is um, I would come off of uh, a payment and closing costs and everything, and I would get into the more macro financial piece of it. Uh, most people that come to me are, as I said, referred by financial advisors. So I get a little more detailed into the breakdown. I say, Dave, you know, one of the things I want to show you now is, is really how cool it is in terms of your net cost to own this. I'm really wondering about some of these other numbers down here. And what I want to explain to you is that while your payment is 24-16-33, and to be clear about it, that's the amount of money you're going to be sending in each month for your payment, it's really less than that in the big picture. Let's start with this tax benefit. And this is a function of taking into account the additional interest you'll have, um, itemizing uh, your, your uh, mortgage interest and your taxes versus taking a standard deduction. So we put your tax bracket in here and uh, calculated what the approximate monthly tax benefit will be to you. This, in, in the macro sense, this kind of means that this 490 times 12, which is about $5,800 a year, is roughly, and it's a ballpark number, what you can expect uh, back as a tax refund in the year that you owned for 12 months versus renting for 12 months in this analysis. So this money is going to come back to you in the form of a tax benefit down the road. And I also talk about how you can adjust your W-4 and get it now if you want, though I, I don't necessarily advise people to do that. In addition to that, when you sell the home, assuming it, it stays the same or goes up in value, the money you pay towards principal is going to come back in the delta between what you sell for and what you owe on your property. So this principal over the long term is going to come back to you. Now there'll be some costs associated with getting to that, and we'll cover those in a moment. So really in the bigger picture, the net monthly payment at the end of the day for you it's about thirteen fifty, and this is the point where you want to compare that to your rent, which is twenty four fifty. So when you pay this twenty four fifty, you don't get anything back. When you pay this twenty four sixteen, a lot of it comes back to you. And 
you know, you've told me you expect to be in this home for five to seven years, so I want to go down to this bottom left quadrant here, and I want to click on the More Info button where it says Rent versus Principal Paid, 84 months, and I just kind of want to walk you through here what was going to happen over a seven-year timeline. So if you just continue to pay your rent, you'll have 225000 in change in rent payments over the next seven years. On this $500,000 30-year fixed rate loan, 20% down, you'll make total payments of about two hundred three over the next seven years. Of that, 55.7 is principal, and will ideally come back to you later on. We'll get to that in a moment. Another 39,000 in tax benefit for a net cost of 108. Now, I use a 3% appreciation rate, which is good nationally, but actually low in the DC area. So uh, being very conservative here, your home after seven years should be worth approximately $614,000. At that time, your loan balance is going to be 344, 238. Now, in order to get at the equity, you are going to have to pay costs to sell the house. And I've made this suggestion to Dave, uh, incidentally, a mortgage coach, to put in here a field that will allow you to put a percentage. But here in DC, it's about 7%. So if I take 615000 times 7% is about $43,000 it will cost you to sell this house. Your total equity is going to be two seventy six ninety nine, dollars And if I subtract the 43000 from it, that gives me $227,000. So what I'm telling you in English here, Dave, is that if you buy this house now, you put 20% down, you take a 30-year fixed rate loan, your home appreciates 3% a year, it costs you 7% to sell it seven years from now, you will have about $227,000 to roll to the next home. And then nice. I stop. Nice. All right. And uh, what percentage of the families that you're delivering this kind of experience with do business with you. you know, what's your conversion rate? You know, um, it's, it's, it's very high. It's probably something that I should do a better job tracking, and I don't. I'm falling down a little bit in that area in terms of tracking my conversion rate. Um, but it's fairly high on this. And what I find is if people are shopping, I, I very often ask them, are they seeing this type of analysis from other mortgage people? And almost always the answer is no. The other guy just sent me a spreadsheet, or he just gave me some numbers, or he just sent me some loan estimates, or whatever. So what I find is that all things being equal, which is very common that you know people are quoting the same rate, I, I tend to win because of something like this. This is a separator for me. Um, even if I'm close within an eighth, oftentimes I win. I think that if you you know if if you some of these rates are quarter better. Better. It, it is hard to win that deal, but if they're the same, you should never lose the deal. And if it's within an eighth, you should oftentimes be able to get it too. I often take a moment at this point in the conversation to explain my mortgages under management program and how I watch out for their loan over the life of the loan. I set auto lock target auto lock targets using my um, my pricing engine, um, and that they'll send they'll get quarterly reports from me uh, tracking their mortgage as well as an annual review call each year to go over it if they want. So those are some additional separators that I use. All right, guys. So, so let's set this out because I know you've got a hard stop here. Craig is sending an email 15 minutes prior to the clients getting set up. The client knows coming into the meeting that they need to be in front of the computer with online access. They click this link. They get a live mortgage coach experience. Um, you notice that there's intentionality to get them to download the app. We all know whether a buyer comes into our office in person, we want to deliver the experience, we want them to download the app so they have the numbers in their back pocket, especially when it's you know pre-property and escrow, you know, this generic rent versus own. They haven't put the home in escrow yet. Numbers are going to change. We want them to know that here's your options, and as you firm this up, we'll update these in real time. Um, so, Craig, real quick, what percentage of your buyers are leveraging the mobile device as part of the experience? So you probably don't know the exact number, but just how much mobile is being used out there, in your opinion? I don't know if they're accessing it later from the mobile device. Obviously, we get the notifications when they access it. I tell them they could see it on their phone as well, but I couldn't really answer that, Dave, with any, with any factual basis. All right. Well, here's, here's what I would say, folks. Think about it, and my goal is that every single time you're helping a family, they're getting a total cost analysis. When I interviewed Simon Sinek, he talked about the concept that that he had worked with a loan officer that he would never work again with. And he, he actually said, do he would ask him, do you use mortgage coach? If they said no, it'd be a deal breaker. Because he just knew the value of a TCA is so much better. So here's a great way, if you can't have the family come into your office, the second best way to deliver an educational experience with Edge Lab. 
So again, take nothing away from the office visit. If you're set up and if you have families come in, you're going to deliver the best experience. You're going to get the most referrals. You're going to have the best conversion. But the second best way is this Edge Live. Uh, we will be doing more training on that. So literally every Monday is for beginners. Every Tuesday, I'm interviewing great people. Next week, I'm going to be interviewing um, Tina um, Bellevue. She is a realtor, does 170 transactions annually, and her number one sales and marketing tool is Facebook. So she's going to talk about how leveraging Facebook and social, she has built you know, a real estate practice as a realtor that's doing 170, helping 170 families a year. Next week, do not miss that call. It's going to be awesome. I also want to remind everybody, every single Wednesday at 11 o'clock Pacific, we are doing mobile training. Uh, so we're teaching you how to turn your mobile device into an awesome teaching tool and an awesome presenting tool. Uh, so um, I did put a link to the video, one of the better, what I would say, recordings. It's 43 minutes, just teaching you guys how to have mobile conversations with Mortgage Coach. You can watch the video and then obviously come to our Wednesday course uh, with myself and Jacob. So, um, you know, what I'd love to do, um, Craig, is I'd love to have you interview you maybe in January or February and go through your whole process and include your annual review. Would you be up for that? Sure. All right. Uh, as much as you want to share on that. Um, so let us know what you thought of today's call. Craig, um, sorry about... Um, you know, kind of the, the start that we had, or the stop that we had earlier, but appreciate you going a little longer. Is there any last advice or anything that you think is real important you want to share with everybody before we wrap it up? Uh, I would just make sure you follow up, uh, ideally, in the next day, a uh, day or two after you do the TCA. It's a really good best practice. Just call and say, hey, I know we covered a lot of information yesterday. Just want to check and see if you have any questions. And very oftentimes, they do where you get some kind of resolution. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. Follow up with me again this time or that time. So follow up is really critical. And the more times you follow up, the higher your likelihood to get the client. Right on. Well, I think Marty Preston, when I interviewed him recently, said it well. Mortgage, help, mortgage coach enables me to show my clients that I'm a professional advisor and not a salesman. We help you do that in person. We help you do that online. And of course, even if you're forwarding the link and you're giving the family the ability to self-serve this data, if you deliver a total cost analysis, they're getting your education and insight all the time. Thanks for joining us today. I uh, look forward to having a lot of you back on next week's call with Tina. Again, she is a realtor. This is a call where I urge you to invite your realtors. And I do believe that the recording of that call will be something that you want to share with your realtors. It help them use social, use Facebook to help families. And we're also going to have Dan Keller as a mortgage coach to help me interview her and just drive value around how to educate, teach, and inspire on social. Take care, Craig. Thanks again for bringing value and sharing what you do and how you do it. Great. Thanks, Dave. Bye, everybody. Take care. Have a great week, everybody.